All right. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to be here with you. I'm Selena Lindahl from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, I've been teaching for 25 years, uh, but I have learned a lot from you just from yesterday. So thank you for all the work and um, hard work that I know you're doing. And I'm excited to be on this process with you. Um, so I'm going to talk about my um, experience with Achieve. I beta tested it this last, we're in a quarter system, so this last quarter. Um, and I also teach, I co-teach uh, a year-long learning community with um, our Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And I've done some work with the Chancellor's Office for years, so I'm, I am increasingly thinking about you know, student success more than I have in, in the past. So um, part of this is motivated by that. I'll also share with you some of my other motivations. Mm. So here, um, here's what I see in my student population, and, and this may be similar to you or may not be. Um, but I, we notice multitasking, we notice, we've talked about this already, not reading the text. Um, they're comfortable with programmed material. The tech savviness, I think we could debate. I've had students ask me what a browser is and why they should change browsers, how they get a new browser. Um, so there's a limit, right? The better our UX gets, I think, the more they don't see what's under the hood and the, the less they know. Um, in uh, I'll be talking about my Principles of Macroeconomics course, so this is mostly first-year students, some second-year students, and some graduating seniors that had put this off because it's a gen ed class. Um, so autonomy and study skills, I would argue, especially in first years, are, are still developing. Um, so there's, there's a lot about modeling and about messaging that I'll be talking about today. Um, my students like and need practice questions, which is great because that aligns well with what we're, what we're learning about how learning works. Um, so I'm happy about that. Um, also, although my particular um, set of students, at least our incoming first year students, um, show more openness to growth mindset than we've seen in the past, they're still fairly, uh, we think, prone to fixed mindset. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, the growth mindset, fixed mindset, uh, Carol Dweck out of Stanford has some nice stuff and there's a good TED talk um, about that. So. In a fixed mindset, failure is especially troubling. Um, if you're a natural mathematician or natural, if, you're, if your mental model is that you're a natural fill in the blank, uh, failure challenges your identity, right? And so there's a sort of um, a shrinking away from effort because effort means you're not, a, to have to display effort in learning means you're not natural economist. So we're fighting that, or I'm fighting that, especially considering that we've got um, a lot of first-generation students, um, which can, that can be even uh, more salient of a threat for them. So I don't think I need to convince any of you that our default model, even down to the layout of our classrooms, is passive. It's built on the lecture model, and it hasn't changed since the 14th century. If you look at photos of the 14th century classroom, the lectern and the obedient students um, really is set up for that sort of reading from the text because nobody else could afford textbooks, right? That's the lecture. Um, so that's, that's clearly behind the times. So if our model is passive, if our, um, if our classrooms are set up this way, how are st our students also in agreement with that? And I would argue that it's a pretty comfortable model for all of us. Um, including instructors. So how, do, how did I structure the class? I'll share with you sort of how Achieve looks. I'll try to keep out the economic parts and just talk about the actual structures. And if there's time at the end, I have some screenshots of some of the assets inside. Um, so how do I structure the class? So my motivation comes from, this is one of the foundational texts, I think. Um, at least we use it a lot in our Center for Teaching and Learning Technology. Um, how learning works. Very um, to the point with both theory and application. So it's something that, that I think is a pretty efficient way to get sort of best practices out there. Um, so again, more on informing my class and informing sort of how we should approach learning. Um, if we're talking about first year stress especially, we have a lot of out-of-state students, a lot of first-generation students. Um, I know some of you deal with international students. I imagine that stress is <coughs> even more um, complex. So we, I think we ignore this at our peril. I'll just say that. Uh, also thinking about mastery, we've used that word a lot. Um, a foundation in, in the How Learning Works book is, you know, mastery takes 
a lot of practice. Um, and we don't expect someone to be good at an army wall without you know, just doing it once. They would have to be um, quite um, an, an outlier to be able to do that. So most of us realize that you don't pick up, uh, what should we say, like a unicycle and begin unicycling right away. It requires lots of effort. So let's, let's apply that to learning and let's message that to students. Um, so messaging is, is pretty important. What are we messaging? The effectiveness of low stakes plentiful practice. Um, and, and thinking about how that might interact with stress, right? So thinking about the stress level of students and reducing the pain of failure might just help. Um, we also need feedback. These are some of the things that are just, uh, again, chapter titles really of the How Learning Works book. <clears throat> um, and probably most of you have seen some of this in, the, in learning science. Uh, we need targeted feedback. That's something that Achieve um, that was really attractive to me for Achieve is that you get, um, and this is from the Sapling um, uh, platform, uh, is we get, you know, specific feedback for specific wrong answers, which is um, very interesting. So goal-directed targeted should be immediate, right? So I also use iClicker quite a bit in class um, to sort of um, prime the pump of that sort of feedback getting my f get, getting their feedback so that I can switch direction and do just-in-time teaching. Um, again, the stress and the climate of the class. So they bring their own stress, but I can add to their stress, I believe, in my... So my class is 230 students, and there's, uh, again, um, on top of their stress, there's a lot of stress, especially for introverts, especially for female students, especially for first-generation. I'm generalizing here. But we have a lot of stress um, built into these classes. Um, peer pressure, asking questions, pretty non-existent in, in such a large passive classroom. So the class climate, how do I deal with, how do, and, and not just how the class is set up, but how is my course set up, right? So am I, am I setting up a course that is scary to students, or am I, um, am I lowering the barriers to students? And this is what I really want to do more and more as I get into the second half of my career, I suppose. So climate matters. And I'm going to sort of give some arguments or give some, some response to some of the pushback that we get in our learning community about, is this our job to care for the emotional needs of our students? Um, and maybe you've heard, maybe you've been in these battles before. Um, we all can debate about this all day long, but for me, if we want, if we're interested in learning, there's no choice but to attend to it, right? So for me, I think, um, you know, if, if it's a fearful climate from the way the class is set up, from the fact that if you fail, you're going, if you fail in the early parts of the class, it's impossible to pass the class. All these things can hinder future learning, and I don't think, um, so I, I think we attend to them, or we ignore them at our own peril, rather. So. I remind myself of this sometimes. Complaining is not a strategy, so let's talk about, um, you know, blaming students for their lack of preparation or blaming students for their lack of success is a tried and true method of avoiding the work ourselves, in my mind. So, messaging. Here's how I message. I show students some of this stuff. I don't know if it always lands well with them, but what do we have here? We have lectures, 5% knowledge retention rate, um, obviously not exact, but as you move down this pyramid, you get better retention from at the bottom. You know, there's reading, then audiovisual, then demonstration, then discussion group. The where the real money makers are: practice by doing, active learning, and teaching others. Um, and so, actually, on my upper division classes, I do team-based learning um, to really capture more of these areas here, um, which I can talk about at another time. But uh, teaching others that. Some of that happens in peer instruction through iClicker, so I'm happy about that as well. I think it's a good, um, it's a good way to use class time. Um, so I message that. I message, I don't, maybe you've seen this um, paper about the effectiveness of high skilled, high um, t teachers, instructors with a lot of experience lecturing. Um, their students don't do as well on this module test, this is in a phys physics course, as the TAs or the, I forget what they were, the graduate assistants that taught 
no lecture, just some problems and eye clickers. Um, so thinking about this, trying to break through the mental model of students that if you're not talking, I'm not learning. Um, so I, you know, sometimes I show them this. We'll have, you know, in the first day, some fun eye clicker questions about <laughs> fun eye clicker questions about the syllabus. You know, asking them to maybe think about like you, like you talked about, I think was it yesterday, correlation and causation, could we have some actual data um, that they chew on rather than just made up um, terms? Anyway, that's, that can do that. I definitely message through the syllabus more and more. My syllabus used to be pretty cute and infographic looking and it's getting longer and longer as I have diversity statements, as I have teaching statements. So anyway, I'm just sort of mm, explaining what active learning is here and explaining the value of trial and error that's in there uh, and then some tips and, and research from what we know about how learning works and then strategies, right? So I think especially helpful for, um, for my, my younger students but also like just it's sort of a expectation setting for the course. Um, I, I don't think we, I don't think they understand learning enough where there isn't value to us reminding them or teaching them and reminding them a multiple amount of times about how learning works. I do sort of try to label more and more questions that are Bloom's level. Um, so if I do eye clicker questions, some of them will be more complex and I'll say this is a, I would tag this as a, a synthesis question or whatever, right? So I think to me there's that, that helps them to see the three dimensions of learning that are happening, or maybe more than three, but the multiple dimensions of learning that are happening, right? It's not, um, it's not just all flashcards. It's, it's other stuff, and how, when you bring in new stuff, how do, you know, how, what should we call that? And can they transfer this into other courses as well? Even if no other teacher ever does anything but lecture, could this help them? And my, my hope is that it can. So what did you need to master in high school to get an A? What level, right? And then what level in college? And that's also an expectation setting. So they, no, nobody in their right mind would say this should be as easy as college, or as easy as high school, rather. Um, so this is how I set up. So now getting into the actual course, this is in the last quarter what I did. You'll notice a lot of weight is on summative assessment in the midterm and final, and that is mostly fear on my part, not knowing what their grades would be and achieve. Um, would, they, would it pad their grades too much? So it, this is heavier on midterm and final than I have done in the past, um, but my grade distribution was still good. So it was perhaps something to keep. Also, I should say, because I've just, I've just sort of preaching about how we need to reduce the cost of failure, and then I show you that there's 70% of the class grade is on midterm and final, but on the final they get a 3 by 5 note card to bring. If their final is better than their midterm, the final replaces the midterm. So there's some sort of, there's some safety net for them. Um, but in general, um, I did about 20% of the points in Achieve and um, found that to, to be pretty good. Uh, engagement was definitely solid in Achieve. And then 10% for in-class uh, in class work, mostly eye clicker. Sometimes there's, there's worksheets or problems that are on paper. But for 230 students, not so much. It's all eye clicker. All right, um, so here's how I envision the process. And this is just a generalized sort of one way to do the flipped classroom or active learning. Students encounter the material, whether that's the text or here's some little screen grabs of, of the Flip It Econ product, so little videos, um, which live and achieve. Then they do, they do questions that are, that are attached to this, including bridge questions, which are some of my favorite parts of the Flip It uh, product, where they have to explain why they thought a certain way, uh, justify their answer. And so then I can go and I can find all the students that answered C, which is the wrong answer, what were their justifications? And that helps me more than almost anything else, right? And then they come to class and they do eye clickers. Um, this is something I do when I, when I have smaller classes. This are if at forms. It's a way to do um, team-based learning. So we do that as well. And then 
really good looking economics instructor with brilliant commentary, shows up, does many lectures where appropriate and needed, and then uh, in class we can get to current events. There's a lot of current events in economics right now, um, and so that there's no shortage of that, but sometimes you want to go deeper. There's worksheets, etc. This is um, a case study about um, the sriracha plant and externalities, the, the, the bad smells coming from the sriracha plant, mm -hmm. angering the neighbors and um, causing all sorts of uh, turmoil in Southern California. So, uh, so that's the process. How did it work? I will tell you um, cautiously optimistic, maybe not quite as optimistic as this fellow, but I collected um, the data over the last few weeks and plotted achieve, so achieve total score here versus final exam, um, just to see was there a positive correlation? Yes, um, there's a positive correlation uh, if you're looking at these two. This person had a uh, tonsillectomy on the day of the final, so she didn't take it, and I don't know, this person dropped out of class early. Um, but so it's positive, but being the curious skeptic that most of us as academics are, it's impossible to know, I think, whether um, this is down to um, just time on task, right? So, would Achieve do better than something else that measured time on task and participation and all that? So, and, and I will say that I will probably show students this. Um, this is enough sort of, I think, fodder to help them be motivated. Um, and uh, certainly it's, it's, I think, helpful for students to see proof of their particular peers doing this work and how it worked. Um, and so, to answer the question about well, is there, does this do better than anything else? I don't have, an, I didn't have half my students use another platform to see what that would look like. That would be interesting. But what I did is I ran their iClicker total scores against their final exam to see, because to me, iClicker is another sort of effort slash attendance um, analytic. And so uh, we did have a positive correlation there, although you can see the distribution, it's not quite as nice. Um, iClicker for me is um, every day, it's probably five to ten questions every day in a two hour class and uh, I run it sort of like you do with um, half credit for, for me it's 50-50, so half credit for answering and another, another half of the credit for getting it right. So there's, um, you can get you know, a, an okay grade by just showing up and getting everything wrong. Um, well you can get 50% I suppose. So um, what's interesting about this, the correlation coefficient was twice as high for Achieve as iClicker, positive, um, and, but the standard deviation was lower. You can probably see that in the data. So in general, I think the story is Achieve must have something maybe, I, I, I believe Achieve has something more than just, m more helpful than just forcing them to do the work, right? There, maybe there's something else going on. Um, and that's, I think that's interesting and, and a, good, um, a good thing to happen. So that's why I am uh, feeling pretty good about it. <laughs>